coming to thrombosis usually thrombosis uh, it is a condition where we see when there's any block or occlusion in the uh, occlusion in the blood flow blood flow through to, to, from to, throughout the blood vessel part and this block um, uh, or the occlusion it is mainly because of the formation of the blood clot which is uh, usually a, a blood clot which has been formed in cases of in the absence of any kind of injury so this formation is known as thrombosis usually we see as in the right side of the picture we see uh, there's a the blood flow is being obstructed because of the formation of thrombus and uh, this uh, th this uh, when this thrombus uh, this formation of thrombus is known as thrombosis and this uh, thrombus when it is being detached from its original site of formation it is known as embolus and this embolus can be carried away into any kind of uh, any kind of organ through the circulation when there's a large thrombus it is no it might result in hypoxia that is it might uh, cause um, usually a decrease in the uh, oxygen carrying capacity which is being carried through the blood since the blood flow is being obstructed when it is a more larger thrombus then it might result in anoxia that is complete deprivation of the oxygen and this condition might lead to a condition known as infarction when there is complete deprivation of the oxygen associated with the blood coming to the cause usually we see that uh, based, uh, based on certain studies it has been observed that uh, this thrombosis is usually a, a tri characterized by a triad of causes. One is hypercoagulability or thrombophilia. Hypercoagulability means hyper. Hyper means increased. Coagulability means increased coagulation. So this increased coagulation is majorly because if there is any alteration in the clotting factors which bring about the coagulation, usually as there is increase in the, um, increase in the quantity of the clotting factors, this might result in the clotting, increased clotting. Otherwise. When there is increased in the platelet addition, since uh, platelets bring about the formation of the clot and when there is increased addition of this platelet, it might also result in hypercoagulability. The, the, the term thrombophilia, this itself means increased in the associate, increased in the platelet count. Other than that, when also we see that the blood viscosity is also increased, this might also result in hypercoagulability. So this is a one of, could be one of the reasons. Other than that, we also see in endothelial cell injury, when there is any endothelial cell injury, uh, the uh, underlying connective tissue which is present in the blood vessels, this is being exposed because of which uh, once this is being exposed, uh, there is a aggregation of platelets to the site of injury and this aggregation of the platelets to the site of injury will cause certain release reaction of the platelets uh, which might cause the further accumulation of the platelets and they are being enmeshed within a fibrin network and this might result in uh, block or uh, any uh, abnormal flow in the blood flow which might also result in thrombosis. Coming to another uh, reason uh, why the thrombosis occurs, it can be because of the disturbed blood flow. Usually we see uh, the kind of blood flow normally how it occurs in a patient is we see within a blood vessel what we see is centrally there is a cell rich zone within the blood vessel which could constitute of leukocytes as well as red blood cells as well as, well as blood, cell, um, blood cells they could be the red blood cells, white blood cells as well as platelets and peripheral to the cell rich zone that is uh, uh, towards the uh, basement membrane or the uh, endothelial membrane lining we see it is a cell free zone this is what is normally seen within a normal blood vessel uh, that is and with a normal blood flow but in case of thrombosis it has been observed that there are two conditions one is turbulence and one is stasis both are the conditions which cause a disturbance in the blood flow in turbulence we see that uh, this blood flow is being uh, being altered and because of which this um, blood cells and the platelets they move towards the endothelial membrane rather than staying within uh, at the center of the blood vessel they are rather away from the uh, center and they are towards the endothelial um, the membrane and because of which um, they might damage the endothelial membrane and rather result in clot formation and obstruct the blood flow so usually in stasis what we see is there's uh, when there's a uh, because of the abnormality in the blood viscosity that is because of in the blood forming cells or otherwise uh, in the thickness of the uh, and um, the thickness of the uh, blood vessel and these alterations might result in stagnant, uh, sta stagnant blood flow that is the blood might not flow because of these uh, abnormal variations and this also could result in disturbed blood flow so these are the two properties what we see in disturbed blood flow one is turbulence and one is stasis so all of these three that is the hypercoagulability endothelial cell injury and disturbed blood flow all of these three contribute to the formation of thrombosis 
coming to the pathophysiology or what occurs uh, why the basically thrombosis occurs is uh, as already discussed endothelial cell injury is one of the reason uh, which might result in a uh, uh, formation of a platelet plug or uh, which to maintain the normal homeostasis and the next is followed by endothelial cell injury that is after the exposure of the connective tissue uh, of the, which is present in the underlying uh, blood vessel uh, we say that uh, the, this area is being accumulated with the platelets uh, once the platelets come and aggregate to this exposed area of uh, injury they, uh, they are being activated this activation results in uh, release of certain granules of the platelets uh, these granules are further consequently cause the further aggregation of the platelets and this platelet aggregation results in uh, uh, activation of the coagulation system uh, as we know the coagulation system con constitutes of the intrinsic uh, pathway uh, where there will be activation of the factor uh, Cog clotting factors uh, factor 9, uh, 8, uh, 10 as well as uh, 7 and uh, further than, further by this there is activation of the uh, extrinsic pathway which is which mediates the activation of the other clotting factors of 5 as well as uh, thromboplastin can also be activated and this uh, both of these pathways together they merge and uh, result cause the activation of the common pathway where we see this conversion of the plasminogen to plasmin and the fibrinogen to fibrin which actually form the platelet plug platelet plug or otherwise known as hemostatic plug or a clot so this is what we see in usually in a, a coagulation pathway and followed by this when there is clot formation there is alteration in the blood flow as already discussed which uh, could be characterized by turbulence or otherwise stasis and this uh, th this will be followed uh, by hypercoagulability of the blood that is increased clotting factors or otherwise uh, uh, it could also result in an increase in the platelet adhesion uh, might also favor this um, uh, clot might favor the increased dilation of the platelets or increased in the clotting factors. So this is the pathophysiology of thrombosis what it occurs. Coming to the basic pathogenesis in brief, usually a uh, hemostatic process, uh, usually once it is being activated either in an injured vessel or otherwise in a slightly injured vessel, it might result in a thrombus formation. And this thrombus formation, if it, uh, uh, it is large enough and it is occluding a blood vessel, it is known as a mural thrombus. Suppose if it is small enough, then this uh, blood vessel, it might cause only occlusion of the thrombosis and which might be further carried away through the blood circulation. And this is a picture showing the normal artery as well as the disease artery. Normally we see, see that the, endothelium, the thickness of the endothelium and the arterial wall and the difference between the disease artery uh, thickness we see that the endothelium it is being increased more in size as well as the arterial wall we can see as along with that we can see even blood clot nothing but the thrombus can be seen which might obstruct the flow of the blood flow. Coming to the classification of thrombosis. Based on the location, they can be classified into venous thrombosis. If it occurs, uh, the thrombus is being formed within the veins, it is known as venous. If it, uh, for, it is forming within the arterial system, it is known as the arterial thrombosis. Based on the venous thrombosis, it can be further classified into deep vein thrombosis when the deep veins are included most commonly in the lower extremities, uh, that is in the femoral part of the leg. Uh, we see uh, when this deep vein is included, we see deep vein thrombosis and most commonly it is seen in the patients who are bedridden and uh, otherwise in hospitalized patients uh, because when the head is above that of the trunk level and there's the abnormal flow of the blood uh, because of the pressure in the blood flow, this might result in a, a abnormal occlusion of the uh, blood flow because of the formation of blood clots and results in deep vein thrombosis. When it involves a hepatic portal vein, then it is known as hepatic portal vein thrombosis. Uh, since uh, hepatic portal vein has a capacity to carry the blood uh, to the other tissues and it also directs the blood, it might result in any occlusion in this hepatic portal vein uh, might result in portal vein thrombosis. Coming to the next vein that is in the kidney uh, that uh, if the renal vein is being uh, affected with this thrombus formation it is known as renal vein thrombosis and when it involves a jugular vein it is known as jugular vein thrombosis. Coming to the venous sinuses which are present within the brain that is the cerebral venous sinus then uh, when there is any occlusion uh, usually it results in a um, stroke and this stroke might further cause myocardial infarction in case of cerebral venous thrombosis. 
Coming to another type of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, it is a cavernous sinus thrombosis when usually when it involves a cavernous sinus within the cerebral cavity. So it is known as cavernous sinus thrombosis. So these are certain venous thrombosis associated when uh, involving the vein part. Coming to the arterial thrombosis, usually we say that uh, it is characterized by stroke can be seen that is uh, in case of conditions like hypovolemia where when there is any disturbances in the abnormal flow to the brain, um, disturbance in the normal blood flow to the brain, it might result in stroke uh, which might in turn cause myocardial impaction that is uh, which, uh, which might manifest with chest pain as well as uh, uh, might also result in sudden death when there is uh, and since blood also carries oxygen supply to the brain as well as to the other tissues of the body, when there's any abnormalities in the blood flow, blood flow uh, which might which might result in consequently in a abnormality or compromised oxygen supply, it might result in myocardial infarction. When it involves the hepatic part, that is in the kidney part, then it is known as hepatic artery thrombosis. So these are certain arterial thrombosis and its manifestations. Coming to the differences between arterial as well as venous thrombosis, we see uh, when the uh, starting with the blood flow, usually we see in the arterial thrombi that uh, the thrombi are usually for they are formed uh, rapidly in the flowing blood of the arteries as well as in the heart. Whereas in case of venous thrombi, we see that it is a uh, slow moving in the blood in the veins. Coming to the sites, most commonly it is seen in the iota, then it is followed by the coronary artery, then it is followed by the cerebral part and then to the mesenteric arteries. Coming to the sites involved in a vein, a venous thromba, usually we see the commonly involved it is the superficial varicose veins uh, which are most commonly involved, otherwise in the deep leg veins can also be involved. Coming to the thrombogenesis, how it is formed? Thrombus, it is formed in arterial. It is usually followed by an endothelial cell injury, whereas in arterial thrombosis, um, where an illustration of atherosclerosis can be given. Whereas in case of venous thromba, it usually we see it is usually following a venous stasis. Most commonly, it is seen in abdominal operations, which could be one of the illustration can be given. Other than that, uh, coming to the differences between arterial and vein based on the development, usually we see that the arterial thromboli it is usually a mural type and it does not occlude the lumen completely. Uh, whereas in the venous type, we see it is usually an occlusive type and uh, usually it uh, takes the uh, cast of the vessel in which it is formed and further it may propagate into in both the directions. That is, it may uh, be in a retrograde or the anterior retrograde directions. Coming to the macroscopic structure, uh, how a grass specimen of an arterial thrombi occurs, it is usually appears as a grey white in colour and is friable uh, usually on the surface uh, and um, whereas in the venous thrombi we see that it is red blue in colour with fibrin stands they can be seen. Other than that we can also see lines of zan which is also present on the surface of this thrombi in both the cases arterial as well as venous thrombi. Coming to the microscopic structure, uh, microscopic features usually we see there are distinct lines of zan which are being present and these uh, are usually uh, they appear as uh, platelets compo composed of platelets fibrin and along with that there are presence of the blood, for blood cells which are usually widely enlarged in case of arterial thrombi whereas in case of venous thrombi we see that the lines of zan are present with more of abundant of red cells uh, when compared to that of the arterial thrombi we see both the cells being seen white as well as red cells whereas in venous we see only more of red cells uh, being seen in, associated with lines of zan. Coming to the effects, that is the consequent effects because of arterial thrombi, usually we see it is associated with the ischemia which leads to the uh, infarct uh, and whereas uh, we see in case of venous thrombi, it uh, is usually results in thromboembolism otherwise in edema. So these are the consequences of arterial and venous thrombi and their dif distinguishing features. Coming to the differences between the anti-mortem thrombi as well as post-mortem thrombi. That is the clots which can be observed before uh, uh, when a patient is living and uh, a patient is, uh, after a patient is being dead. Usually we see grossly this or anti-mortem thrombi uh, that is a patient when he is alive. We see they are usually dry, granular, firm and fried. Whereas the post-mortem they are usually gelatinous and usually they are rubbery in consistency when viewed as a gross specimen. 
And coming to the relation to the vessel wall, usually we see that they are in the anti-mortem part they are adherent to the vessel wall. Whereas in the post-mortem part we see that they are weakly attached to the vessel wall. Coming to the stage, um, usually we see the state um, mostly they may or may not be associated with the vascular counters. But where, whereas in post-mortem clot we see that they take the shape of that of the normally that of the vessel. Microscopic features we see that the surface it usually contains presence of uh, these lines of zan normally we being seen as we have seen in the differences in arterial as well as in venous but whereas in postmodern clots that is after the patient has been dead we see that the say, uh, that the surface is uh, usually we see a uh, yellow which, uh, fat appears as a uh, that of a chicken fat which is yellow in color and uh, are usually uh, appears the jelly uh, also. So these are certain differences between the anti-postmortem as well as in the postmortem clots or the thrombi. Coming to the fate of the thrombus, that is what happens uh, once the thrombus has been formed. It usually um, because of the effect of the fibrinolytic activity and the release of uh, plasma from this uh, fibrinolytic system, uh, this might completely get resolved. That is, it might uh, break uh, be is being broken down and being completely resolved. So suppose if the clot is not being or the thrombus is not being resolved, um, this might be further organized with the help of macrophages. Macrophages which are usually aid in uh, the cell deployment and removing of the cell debris as well as of the foreign antigens. When this macrophages they are reach the site of this uh, thrombus and try to remove the debris uh, but rather um, once they try to remove the debris and this is being uh, incompletely removed and uh, rather it is being uh, um, supplied more with the uh, overlying granulation tissue as well as with the new nourishment with the underlying blood vasculature this might cause the organization that is more of it of deposition of the granulation tissue and blood vascularization might result in organization of the well formed thrombus and this thrombus um, it might cause a propagation that is it might further grow up in size and from there it might reach um, this thrombi it might get detached from the site of origin and might be flowing uh, might pass through the blood circulation and go and lodged into any kind any of the other organs and this condition is known as thromboembolism so there is a fate of thrombus usually what we observe so major complication of the uh, thrombus formation is embolization that is detachment of this thrombus and passage of this thrombus uh, through the blood circulation is known as embolization and this uh, uh, this uh, embolus might get lodged into any other kind of uh, any other organ so as the picture shows that uh, as a thrombus from the site of origin it is being carried through the blood circulation along with the blood cells and where it gets uh, lodged into an other an other area of the blood vessel Coming to embolism, so the process of formation of embolism, uh, emboli is known as embolism. Emboli is the other cooler, whereas embolus it is a singular form of the um, singular form. And this embolus, as already discussed, it could be either a, um, it is a, usually it is a clot, it could be a clot or otherwise a fat globule or otherwise any gaseous content uh, which has been released uh, during any operation surgeries or uh, during any um, obstetric conditions, uh, it might result in the formation of embolus, that is which is an occlusion, occluding part for the blood vessel. And this, uh, when it occludes, uh, when it obstructs the blood flow, it is known as vascular occlusion. This might result in vascular occlusion. And coming to uh, differences between a thrombus and an embolus, usually we see uh, thrombus. It is usually seen as this. Uh, uh, it is um, uh, concise to its side of origin. But whereas embolus, we see it uh, usually care. this thrombus when it is being detached from its site of origin itself is known as embolus. So, so this is a major contrasting feature which is in between a thrombus and an embolus. Coming to the classification, based on its site of presence, it is known as, uh, it is being classified when it is being present in an arterial vessel, then it is known as an arterial embolus. When it is being present in a venous part, it is known as venous emboli. And usually uh, this venous uh, embolite might result in a right heart failure, can also be one of the complications uh, when it involves in a venous emboli. Coming to another part, it is known as paradoxal or other than as crossed embolus. Usually it is seen when the emboli is being passed from the venous part to the arterial part. So in this condition, usually we see that uh, they uh, they usually uh, in case of arterial venous shunt or otherwise any uh, so any inter uh, inter uh, intra arterial septum uh, defects, we see that this uh, passage of embolus occurs from the venous to the arterial part. 
come into the direction um, since embolus is uh, nothing but a thrombus which is being carried through the blood circulation so usually it follows when it follows out of the direction of the blood flow it is known as anterograde uh, embolus when it uh, follows away from the uh, other than that of the blood direction flow because placed on the size of the embolus or otherwise in the uh, disturbances in the blood pressure then it is known as retrograde type of embolus Coming to a major part, the pulmonary thromboembolism. Usually, it is usually because of any uh, obstruction in the pulmonary blood flow. Uh, it might result in a formation of pulmonary thromboembolism. Majorly, it is because of a thrombi which is being uh, carried through the pulmonary blood circulation. That is through the towards the lung, and this might result in um, formation of pulmonary thromboembolism. And uh, usually it is because of the formation of a, uh, majorly it is because of a blood clot which is being formed uh, uh, when there is any rupture to the lung vessels or otherwise uh, when there is any uh, sudden uh, inhalation of the any uh, foreign antigen it might result in this formation of the uh, embolus. Since embolus it could be a fat globule or otherwise a gas, uh, this uh, abnormal uh, condition of this gaseous contents can also result in formation of pulmonary thromboembolism. Usually this consequences of the pulmonary thromboembolism could include since uh, pulmonary that is the lung part it is a major source for the inhalation and exhalation and it is involved in the respiratory system so any kind of obstruction might result in sudden and in instantaneous death of the patient. So this could be one of the consequence or the complication of pulmonary thromboembolism. Coming to another uh, type of um, complication it is the acute core pulmonial where we see that the patient it might show uh, any congestive uh, heart failure otherwise right heart failure can also be a result uh, since um, lung is being also involved in the um, in uh, circulating the uh, Oxygen, oxygenated blood to the other body parts. Uh, so this passage of uh, this oxygenated blood might be uh, might also be obstructed uh, to, to the heart because of this uh, the cardiac output might uh, show a compensatory adaptory mechanism to compensate this uh, lack of this blood flow and might result in acute core pulmonary. So and other than that we can also see pulmonary infarction nothing but there is a reduced oxygen supply uh, to the pulmonary area and because of which um, the deprived oxygen it might result in pulmonary infarction. And then occlusion or emboli which are being organized properly uh, organized might also result in pulmonary hemorrhage which might manifest as hemoptoises can also be seen. Usually other than this uh, very rarely uh, this pulmonary emboli can also resolve, uh, they can undergo resolution that is as they are friable in nature they might get detached uh, from their other side uh, wherever, wherever they have been lost and this might result in resolution. The other uh, consequences it can also be chronic core pulmonary that is it might further uh, result in a long standing cases and result in chronic core pulmonary otherwise it might also uh, alter that the hypertension present within the lungs and can show pulmonary result in pulmonary hypertension or otherwise it might result in arteriosclerosis that is it might cause the um, alteration in the arterial blood walls that is it might bring about the hyalinization and fibrosis of the arterial wall and result in arteriosclerosis. So these are certain consequences of pulmonary thrombo embolism. Coming to the fat embolism, usually we say uh, it could be uh, the etiology of this fat embolism, it could be either the traumatic cases or otherwise say non-traumatic cases. Amongst the traumatic cases, the trauma it could be either to the bone or otherwise to the soft tissues. Whereas in non-traumatic cases, we see it is a they are any they rather than um, rather than any direct trauma, it is usually because of uh, any abnormal accumulation of uh, fat uh, usually seen in uh, patients associated with obesity kind of conditions. And usually there have been certain theories which have been suggested uh, based on the pathogenesis of this fat embolism. Amongst them, mechanical theory is one theory where we see. Coming to the pathogenesis of fat embolism, usually we see uh, there have been many theories which have been proposed uh, but nothing has been yet clear and amongst them mechanical theory is one theory which is usually based on the uh, etiology that uh, any trauma to any bone or otherwise any blood vessel might result in uh, uh, um, might result in mobilization of the fat globules and these fat globules they might accumulate and result in the formation of fat emboli and most commonly it is seen in injury to any blood vessel or any bone tissue bone marrow tissue coming to our next theory it is the emergence instability theory 
and with this theory it is based on a cause or that it is it could be of non traumatic cause uh, and most commonly uh, it is um, th this theory suggests that uh, if there is any disturbance in the emulsification that is emulsification is nothing but it is the breakdown of the fats into the micro metabolic by products uh, which have been which can be easily metabolized for the so if there's any disturbances with, within this em emulsification, it might result in accumulation of this uh, fat globules and result in the formation of fat embolization. So in the, coming to the next theory, it is the intravascular, uh, intravascularization, intravascular uh, coagulation theory. In this theory, we see uh, when patients are exposed to conditions such as stress, uh, there's activation of the uh, vascular, this uh, intravascular disseminated intravascular coagulation because of this, uh, which might actually uh, help in uh, help in or alter that of the fat mobilization and result in formation of fat emboli. So this also been said to be one of the reason. Coming to the toxic injury theory, it is usually uh, because of uh, toxic as the name itself suggests when there's presence of high amount of free fatty acids uh, present in the blood plasma level. This could uh, this could be toxic to the patient and this toxic uh, nature of this presence of uh, increase in the number of fatty acids within the plasma might result in the accumulation of this free fatty acids and result in the formation of fat emboli and this could be one of the pathogenesis why the fat embolism occurs. The major consequences what we see uh, is uh, pulmonary fat embolism. Usually it has been uh, observed that uh, in a patient who has been suffering from uh, uh, bone fracture and has further and as a consequence of bone fracture has been uh, led to death. Uh, in this patient when the post-mortem has been done, it has been observed that there was numerous present of fat emboli which are fat globules which have been observed in the capillaries of the lung and this has been said to be an association between the pulmonary fat embolism and the fat embolism. So by this it has been suggested as one of the consequences of fat embolism. Coming to the next type of consequence of fat embolism, it is a systemic fat embolism. Usually we see uh, as said systemic it can be seen generalized in any organ involvement it could be in the um, say from the heart to the kidney or the brain or liver uh, spleen it could involve any kind of organism and uh, since emboli have a nature or of uh, mobilization that they can be carried to any area through the blood circulation they might get lodged and get organized into any organ of the body so this is about the fat embolism Coming to another types of embolism, the, the systemic embolism as already explained, the emboli have a character of a mobilization, they can be carried into any organs in the body and might get lodged and further get organized and result in the formation of systemic embolization. Coming to another type of embolization, it is the amniotic fluid embolism. In amniotic fluid embolism, we usually see in conditions such as delivery condition or post uh, postpartum conditions where we see there's uh, uh, there's accidental uh, uh, in intake of the fluid amniotic fluid uh, either by the mother or by the child. This fluid might accumulate, uh, which is being carried to the through the uterine vein, and might result in the formation of emboli. And this could also result in amniotic fluid embolism. Coming to another embolism known as atheroembolism, which is a consequences of the formation of atherosclerotic plaques that are the nothing but the plaques or otherwise which are the occlusions occlus occlus which have been formed within the arterial blood vessel. Uh, this might result in atheroembolism and it might uh, result in arteriosclerosis if it is not being recognized and removed at an early stage. Coming to tumor embolism, usually it is seen in conditions such as malignant conditions most commonly where the tumor uh, as uh, malignant tumors have a characteristic nature of metastasis uh, that is they are being uh, this tumor cells they have a property of being carried away either through the hematogenous uh, route or otherwise through the lymphatic route. So these uh, when they are being carried out through these any of these either of these routes might result in tumor embolism. Coming to the miscellaneous embolism, uh, it is embolism which is being either because of an endogenous source or the exogenous source, either because of any friable vessel wall after any ex exposure to injuries or otherwise because of any uh, abnormal accumulation of the fluids or otherwise gaseous fluids or the flat, it might result in any kind of uh, endogenous or otherwise exogenous embolism. 
Coming to another type of emboli, it is a gaseous emboli. This emboli, it is usually most commonly seen associated with that of the, uh, um, the air, embolis air embolism where we see uh, when there is abnormal um, uh, inhalation or uh, uh, where there is uh, congestion of the nitrogen gases or otherwise any other gases present within the body or otherwise away from outside which are being ex on exposure to harmful uh, gases, it might result in air embolism. The other most commonly seen associated uh, disease with this gas embolism is decompression sickness. So coming to the picture which shows the embolic stroke which can be seen in the first picture uh, which most commonly involves the cerebral area uh, when that involves the cerebral vein. Coming to the amniotic fluid embolism can also be seen which is being carried from the uh, uh, mother to the uh, fetus uh, through various routes can be also be seen in the picture. Coming to the venous air embolism, uh, amongst uh, which is uh, which is one of the gas embolism, it could be uh, based on the structures involved. If it is a vein involved, which is being involved, it is known as venous air embolism. If it is an artery which is being involved, it is known as arterial air embolism. If it is a venous air embolism, we see it is most commonly seen in patients who are associated uh, who have been uh, had a history of operations in the head and neck as well as in the trauma since these patients are completely bedridden and hospitalized and the uh, position of these patients is in such a way that the head is raised above the trunk and uh, this venous uh, blood flow uh, it is also being altered these patients are more of a, of a risk uh, to have this venous air embolism and in obstacle operations as well as in trauma we see that uh, sudden uh, uh, sudden movement of the amniotic fluid or otherwise uh, uh, the fluid which is being passed from the uterine vein can also result in this conditions of uh, venous air embolism and also in conditions like uh, in intra, uh, intravenous infusion of uh, blood as well as in fluid condition when there is uh, the pressure or the passage of this fluid it is in an abnormal level it is not counteracting with that of the blood flow circulation might also result in uh, abnormal accumulation or um, the entrapment of the air within this veins intravenously and might result in venous air embolism. And in conditions such as angiography, which is nothing but a condition where the, the it is a it is a condition where the uh, arteries as well as the uh, intracellular structures, the intrinsic structures are supposed to be identified uh, for any uh, diagnosis of disease. In these conditions also, we see that there is a, a air being entrapped within the vein, and this might result in venous air embolism. And coming to the effects, what we see in venous air embolism, it is based on the amount of air that is usually we see or it could be or it should not exceed that of the 100 ml. Um, if this exceeds above the 100 ml, it might result in venous air embolism. Even it is based on the rapidity. If it is a slow, slow occurring or otherwise it's a chronic or rapidly occurring, it might also uh, result in venous air embolism. Coming to the position of the patient, uh, usually as said in the first one, operations uh, can also be one of the reasons which might uh, lead the patient to become bedridden and cause this venous air embolism to occur. Even in certain other general conditions or that is exposure to the alterations in the altitudes might also result in venous air embolism. Coming to the arterial air embolism, usually we see in conditions such as CT surgeries, that is the cardio uh, cardiothoracic surgeries, uh, patients being exposed um, where the arterial vessels uh, when they are being uh, accidentally exposed or injured might also cause the uh, entrapment of the air within this arteries and result in arterial venous embolism, arterial air embolism. And even in conditions such as paradoxical air embolism, uh, in conditions where there's uh, AV shunts, arteriovenous shunts or uh, any abnormalities in the interatrial septum might also result in entrapment of this air might result and further cause arterial air embolism. And in conditions such as arteriography as already explained in venous air embolism could also be one of the reasons for this air embolism to occur within the arteries. Coming to the effects, usually we find the patient might manifest with the presence of marble skin appearance and uh, air bubbles can also be observed uh, which might manifest as vesicles and bullet and um, at the microscopic level uh, it can also be observed uh, within the arteries and um, the patient might manifest as paler because of the alteration in the blood circulation and the patient uh, might be exposed to anemia which results in paler of the sclera skin as well as in the tongue. And the other effect, it could be the coronary as, uh, as well as, or otherwise uh, if it involves the heart, it can result in coronary arterial embolism. If it involves the brain, it might result in cerebral arterial embolism. 
So this is what is about the air embolism when it's con uh, a part of gaseous embolism. Coming to the decompression sickness, uh, which is also a type of gaseous embolism, usually it is known as a Kazan's disease since it was being observed in the workers who have been working in the caseous uh, factories and also known as diverse palsy since it was being uh, observed in the divers who have been exposed to abnormal uh, pressures, uh, sudden variation in the atmospheric pressure and this uh, has been led to this uh, gaseous embolism and also in conditions such as aeroembolism can also be seen. And uh, so these are the uh, synonym, uh, synonyms for the decompression sickness. Coming to the pathogenesis, we see in case of divers, uh, where we see the sudden alteration in that of the exposure of sudden high atmospheric pressure, the patient is being exposed, individual is being exposed to such uh, sudden high atmospheric pressure because of which uh, there's alteration in the gases which is present within the body and uh, because of which uh, there's abnormal uh, variations in the nitrogen as well as in the oxygen and in superoxide, carbon dioxide levels in the body and this might result in the gaseous embolism formation. Whereas in aeroembolism, we see also the similar level uh, in conditions such as uh, um, uh, unpressurized cabins in uh, air flights, uh, where we see the patient is also being altered with uh, this atmospheric pressure levels and because of which it might result in aeroembolism. So these are certain pathogenesis, which is the reason why the gaseous embolism occurs in decompression sickness. Usually we see that uh, in acute form that uh, the effects coming to the effects of decompression sickness, we see in the acute form, the patient is characterized by the bends where we see that uh, the patient has um, abnormal pain in the joints and suddenly uh, awakes from the bed or jumps up on the bed we see this is one of the manifestation other than that we also see that there are chokes also present that is the patient might uh, show uh, abnormal um, uh, abnormal levels in the breathing part uh, can also be seen in the cerebral effects we see that the patient might uh, 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 might manifest in coma or otherwise in dysphagia can also be seen coming to the chronic forms we see um, usually there's uh, a ne ischemic necrosis of the bone that is uh, avascular necrosis can be seen neurological symptoms such as paresthesia and paraplegia can also be manifesting and in lung involvement, we see that the patient is suffering from cough, hemoptosis as well as throat pain can also be seen. Skin manifestations, we see that the patient might manifest with presence of certain allergies as well as uh, red erythematous areas can also be observed in case of chronic forms of decompression sickness. So this is what is about the gaseous embolism.